Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Community Matters. As you know, we have been doing a series of instant, as close to instant as we can get, issues that show up maybe once in a while, but not every day. Mm -hmm. And today was one of those days. The President of the United States said that he could get rid of part of the 13th Amendment by executive order. And that is children that are born to immigrants. He wants, right now, they, can, they are citizens, American citizens. He wants to do away with that. And so I asked our former Attorney General, Lieutenant Governor, and dear friend, because you know that I only talk to dear friends, my dear friend, Doug Chen, to talk to us about the 14th Amendment, 13, 14, and 15th Amendments, what to the Constitution of the United States, what they mean, and can he or cannot do away with it. Doug? Great. Thank you for coming. Uh, Marcia, it's always great to be on your show. <laughs> Anytime you want to call me up, I, I, I'm here. Yeah, that's, that's how special you are. And, and I, oh, know, your show. I know that uh, with all your viewers, you always talk about very important issues. And so it's an honor to be able to talk about this. And uh, uh, even though it's a, a very serious day and, and uh, our, our president continues to uh, just uh, flummox all of us with, with the various statements that for, he makes. Yeah, for anyone that doesn't remember, this is the gentleman that did the first, the very first time that Trump said something stupid that he <laughs> about keeping the Muslims out of America. You were the first attorney general to go get him. Sure. So, sure. so tell us about the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, what they are, and can he do anything? Sure. Well, I, I mean, I, I think if you really want to ask about the, the amendments to the Constitution and why they became such a part of our, our U.S. history, it, it really was, um, those were parts of the Constitution that came into place um, after the Civil War uh, when slavery was abolished and uh, the United States, uh, through its leadership, through Abraham Lincoln and through so many of the people that are, are heroes of us, all of us in, in American history, uh, made decisions that were uh, deciding that uh, people are equal, that, that there is no one superior race over another, um, that you can't enslave people, uh, and that you need to treat people uh, equally uh, and justly uh, in, in everything that the, the American government does. And so that's really the, you know, yeah. the most basic uh, standpoint of, of where all of this comes from. Um, and so, and part of those, uh, part of those uh, amendments that, that came through during that time uh, was, the, um, was the amendment that says that everybody who is born in the United States um, is a citizen of the United States. And, and really the history behind that was the idea that uh, if somebody was uh, born of a slave or, or somebody who was formerly a slave, um, then that person, uh, that, that child, was going to be a citizen of the United States, and so what you see is, is that these these amendments are, are really uh, and the idea of um, a birthright uh, to that that allows you to become a citizen of the United States. It, it came from that kind of history, that that kind of um, uh, desire to to really be able to make sure that that we were able to treat people justly. Um, there were some U.S. Supreme Court cases that actually. Uh, he even came from, uh, um, had to do with um, Chinese American uh, immigrants mm -hmm. that, that came to the U.S. Um, that were decided by the United States Supreme Court. So, so it, it has been uh, addressed by our U.S. Supreme Court saying that the children of Chinese immigrants uh, that come to the United States when they're born in the U.S., then they're citizens of the U.S. So our U.S. Supreme Court held that back in the 1890s. So, 
this has been around for a long time. So here we are today. Uh, you know, President Trump has said what he said. You're so timely. This is. I, I feel like we're on CNN. This is how. This is how present day we we are and what's going on. I mean, I think what everybody's saying. Bottom line, before I mean, I think we can talk about this issue. Um, I mean, bottom line. If, Everybody's saying this is just a political stunt by President Trump before the midterm elections to, to appeal to his base. Um, but if anything, I, I can see what, it, what we get all out of all of it is it's a great opportunity for us to be able to revisit history, for us to remind ourselves why it is that, that we believe the things that we do uh, and, and to really reaffirm those values. What well, do you think, perhaps, that he really is a ploy or do you think he doesn't know that he can't? with an executive order do away with an amendment to the Constitution. Do you think do you think that's just a ploy or does he really believe that he can do that? Because the reason I asked you to talk about it, so many people do not understand what it takes to remove an amendment to the Constitution. Sure. Well, your first question is, is whether or not President Trump really understands the Constitution. I, I don't think he does. I mean, that, that's why he makes all the decisions that, that he does, uh, you know, and whether or not he, he means to do it just to be able to stir up the U.S. or, or to get people to focus their attention on him. I, I, I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, but but I, I do care uh, in the sense that whenever this comes up, uh, it really makes people have to ask themselves, okay, well, then why is it that our Constitution um, stands for what it, what it stands for, and and so, uh, so bottom line, uh, you know, when it when it comes to this, um, first of all, it's wrong for the president to say something like this because when he took his oath to be of office, then he swore to uphold the United States Constitution, just like when I became the attorney general or when I became the lieutenant governor, I swore to uphold the United yeah. States Constitution. So that's why it, it's a, it's incumbent upon me, not just as a private citizen, but it, within my office. Uh, to call him out on on whether or not we we have these these violations of the Constitution, like like the president is talking about. Do, do you think that he truly understands that? Uh, no, I, I mean I, I just I, think that it's it's just something that. He, I mean, he would just as soon be a dictator where he could do this. Right. Well, and and it appeals to it appeals to a, a certain portion uh, of the population. Uh, that that wants to go back to a time uh, where you were able to exclude certain races, certain minorities, uh, based upon uh, based based upon things Whatever, like yeah. like whether or not they 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 were born in the in the U.S. or or, or not or things like that. And and I, I just think that that's very um, it's very troubling. It, it goes against the, the history of the U.S. Uh, you know, even trying to set himself up in in sort of t by taking sort of dictatorial type. Actions like this, even that goes against uh, what the U.S. government stands for. So, um, there was this Chinese Exclusion Act, and there were times when, in spite of these amendments, minorities were not treated very well. Right. Uh, even the war in uh, Korea, the Koreans had to petition the American. The Koreans living in America had to petition the government to allow them to fight in that war. Sure, sure, and, and it all starts with leadership at the top. I mean, I, I mean, I think what what I hear from what you're talking about is that oftentimes when when you end up with uh, bad decisions or 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 even worse, that the public being you know kind of the average person in, in the public uh, being riled up against a certain minority group. Uh, it, a lot of it comes because you you have a leader uh, that says things that denigrates or puts down or characterizes a minority group as um, a stereotype or, or as a, something that's less than human. So back in the day uh, when the the Chinese were excluded from the the, the U.S., it, it all started with with a lot of political cartoons, um, a lot of uh, uh, just different. Uh, uh, words that, what, that were said by the leaders is that at the top. The, the coolies yeah, were building calling, the railroad. Yeah. Is that right? Right. So, so in other words, uh, you know, describing the people uh, who had built the railroad as somehow less than human, portraying them in cartoons as such. Uh, you know, that that's 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 not that far off. That, that, I mean, that was like well, more than a hundred years, years ago. But that's yeah. not more than a hundred years ago. But it, it's not that far off from uh, from just the president today. 
uh, describing Mexicans as people who are all criminals or rapists or people who are bringing Do firearms across the border, um, describing Muslims as all terrorists. It, it's that same kind of rhetoric that I think then the average person hears the leader of our country saying, and then it starts to uh, it, it starts to weigh on them. It's mm -hmm. it's like a, a, a horrible uh, negative marketing campaign. Do you think that he knows that the Americans took Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, California from the Mexicans? Sure. Well, Does he I know mean, that? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, no. I, mean, I, I just think that it's, <laughs> no. I, I, I don't no. begin to understand <laughs> his mind because there, there, no, there's there a lot is of no such. Are, yeah. Yeah. All, all I know is that what ends up coming, all I know is the result of it or the consequences that it, 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 um, it revs up uh, a certain group of people to now feel empowered uh, to be able to say, well, look, my president is, is talking about something like this. Uh, so therefore, uh, so therefore, the worst instincts that I have inside of me, I can now be able to verbalize those prejudices, or even worse, I can act on them. Act on them, like this, this week, or last week, I guess it was, Saturday before last, and the man went into a black church. The doors were locked, so he couldn't shoot up the church. So he goes to a grocery store and shoots two people who just happened to be black. Right. He, he didn't know who they were. Right. Then, then and, and you're actually bringing up a, a story um, that didn't get much reported, that didn't get reported much because there were so many other, other stories, stories going yes. on uh, of like somebody who was sending bombs, bombs to all these other, you know. And then these, after yeah, that right. is the synagogue. Uh, was, which, so tragedy it, after tragedy. tragedy. It's uh, like this week has been an unbelievable week. Right. Um, and then today, even though the mayor of Pittsburgh had asked the president not to come for the funeral, and he came anyway. And so now we've got all these people in this little town trying to surround his car, trying to say, no, we don't want you here. We want to bury our dead in our sacred time and place. We don't want you, which was an incredible scene as they surrounded the car, the, the president's car, so he goes off to to the hospital where there was still some people. Right, I, I don't actually know enough about the details of what happened today, but, but what I do think is happening is that there are people who want to hold uh, the president or his administration responsible for the words that they say, that it's, it's not enough to just uh, say all of these things and, and then um, at the time a tragedy occurs to then pretend that you never said those things. Yeah, well, I, but I think that they were right in saying we want to take care of our dead. We want this to be a sacred moment. And as you know, when the president comes, all the security people and all of this entourage comes with him, and that just gets in the way. And I, I, I think that the, they wanted that time to be sacred. Sure. I, I, I would assume that simply because you know about all the security that goes lockstep. So, uh, tell us now about this thing of wanting, think, saying that he was going to change the 13th Amendment. Now, no, I'm sorry, the 14th Amendment. Now, tell us what would it take to change an amendment to the Constitution? What, what, how, do, how do we oh go about goodness. that? Well, um, I, I think changing any amendment to a constitution, I mean, it, it requires the, the vote of the people, and it requires Congress, actually, to be able to, uh, to be able to, uh, get an amendment like that to even be teed up for, for that to happen. So um, I, I think there would be a lot of very serious steps that would have to take okay. place. We, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in 60 seconds. Sure. One minute. Okay. okay. Hello. My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour, 
We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Marcia, and we're back. This is Community Matters. Today we are talking to, of all people, my dear friend, Lieutenant Governor Doug Chen. I have to get used to all the different titles. Correct. <laughs> Me too. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we're talking about the President of the United States saying that he was going to change the 14th Amendment so that children born here in the United States to immigrants were not citizens. And he said incorrectly that we were the only country, nation in the world that allowed this kind of thing to have people that were born on this territory or in the state to be a citizen. A, that was wrong. There are 30 other nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights addresses that sort of thing. So, but those are things he doesn't know about. So tell us, what would it take to change a con the Constitution? Not just this, but obviously not an executive order. So what, what does it take? What are the mechanics of changing a con uh, an amendment? Sure. Well, let me start off by saying that uh, President Trump isn't trying to introduce a constitutional amendment because what he was saying is that he could just do it by executive order, that right. he could just be able to order and, and get around what the Constitution says and, and basically create a, a constitutional crisis if he were to do something like that. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, who's uh, South Carolina, who, who is a uh, known conservative, uh, tried to introduce uh, or uh, tried to introduce a constitutional amendment back in 2010. Um, that uh, addressed this this very issue didn't get out of the uh, starting blocks. Um, who knows if if this uh, this and these new statements don't empower him to do something like this? Um, but getting to your question of what would it take to be able to make a constitutional amendment take place, uh, it, it really takes a, a, a large majority of the states, two thirds, uh, to to all be able to uh, go along with something like that, as well as just uh, you know a, a vote of the people, a vote of the Congress, uh, in, in order to be able to um, get all these things to happen. So it's unlikely um, that that you would be able to pull off that kind of constitutional amendment. Um, I, I think the the danger is that, like like I said earlier, when you have a leader that that says these very radical, um, really just. Uh, just statements that, that just go so far against uh, what you would normally, uh, what we would normally believe in as Americans or as people who live in the state of Hawaii. Uh, when you have those statements made, then it empowers uh, people to say, I'm going to introduce a constitutional amendment like that, or I'm going to get, I'm going to begin a discussion uh, on those topics. What in Hawaii, where we have so many uh, people from so many different con countries, cities, states, uh, do you think, especially those coming from countries where there are dictators, do you think that that kind of rhetoric would scare them? If they have children, do you think that would scare them oh, to I, hear him say that? Yeah, I mean, I think the anti-immigrant rhetoric that, that takes place now is, is scary to people even when it doesn't apply to them. So that, that was something that, uh, that I, I experienced firsthand when, when I saw uh, the, the Muslim ban go through, uh, it, it caused uh, a lot of people who were foreigners who were thinking about going to the University of Hawaii to reconsider the offer that was made to them from UH, even though they didn't come from one of the countries that was banned. Uh, they said, well, it doesn't really sound like the United States is a very uh, conducive place these days that, that's very welcoming to foreigners, so I, I'm going to be educated in Canada or Australia, oh, uh, or I'm going to work for companies in Canada <laughs> or Australia. Uh, so, you know, there, there is no question that, that as much as um, those of us who disagree with the president might scoff at how effective he can actually be, it, it does have an indirect effect because it, it, it tells the rest of the world, um, well, America is not what you were 
accustomed to seeing in terms of the values that it stood for. And so you should rethink uh, how much you want to do business with or, or to have a relationship with people who are in the U.S. Has that uh, hindered foreign business, do you think? Oh, well, we, we certainly made that argument that, that, um, that basically uh, for, for foreign uh, commerce or, or for being able to uh, help our, make our economies more productive, uh, whether it's in, in the rest of the U.S., but right here, here uh, in the state of Hawaii, here. where a quarter of our businesses are foreign-owned and a quarter of the people who live here, one out of four of the people who lived here were, were uh, born uh, in else. a foreign country. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not even counting children of, of immigrants like myself or grandchildren of immigrants like Governor Ige. Uh, the, it's, this is just a, this is a place that has uh, long uh, celebrated um, diversity and, and being able to reach out to the international community, being welcoming to the international community. Um, so, so I think that there's a lot of evidence that these kinds of statements, um, it, it eventually, it does hurt our economy right here That's in, in Hawaii. Now, I, I'm, back in the 70s, I forget when it was, when we had the oil strike, mm -hmm. and all of the 49 states had the oil strike, and we didn't. And finally, there was this great cartoon, and it showed the Arab, you know, this tra traditional dress, and a Hawaiian dressed in hula, you know, so you could really <laughs> said, funny you don't look like Americans. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> then they rationed the oil. Hmm. When they said, oh, that's a part of the United States, then we'll ration the United States. <laughs> so, but, you know, I thought that was so precious. Wow. It, it, people sometimes don't think that way until they, like you said, they weren't willing to come to school here, and then all of a sudden that's like, oh, that's a part of America. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and and I, I heard Vice President Pence talk uh, about how he was trying to draw a distinction, saying, well, I think what the president is really trying to do is he's trying to stop people. So let's just be completely fair to the president. And I think what Vice President um, Pence is saying is that is that we're talking about um, the children of illegal immigrants. Those are the people who should be denied uh, citizenship. Uh, again, I, I think that's a very slippery slope that, that we're talking about because um, the bottom line, it's there, there's something there's something about um, being born in the U.S. Just like you said, that that's part of our international moral fabric. Uh, being born in a country uh, that that makes you a citizen of that country. What about the Dreamers? Weren't they born here? Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, no. I, 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 I take that back. So Dreamers were people who were brought, children who were brought into the, the U.S. Um, so that's, that's how that, that took place. So they can't become citizens? They're not eligible for citizenship? Correct. Correct. So because they were, because they were brought into the U.S. and then were raised here, uh, if they'd been born in the U.S., they would have been citizens of right. the U.S. But because they were brought into the U.S. Uh, and then grew up within the American culture, there, there's not really a mechanism under our immigration laws that, that allows them to become citizens because they're the children of people who illegally entered the U.S. Um, so right, right away, I mean, even what we're talking about now, um, the fact that we're having this discussion, uh, it, just, it just shows you how far off we've gone because uh, we, we obviously, there's, there's a lot of aloha even in Hawaii for people who are dreamers. Uh, we, we most recently know how the community was so upset when that, um, that coffee farmer right. uh, was, was deported. Did we and, ever and get him other, back? No, no. Oh. No. It, it seems to me that he had a family and a farm. What happens to the family when you just throw him away? Right. Right. What happens to them? Well, and, and I think that that's part of the um, the attack that takes place. So, so as much as we, you know, all those of us on the, the legal side of these things will will uh, will fight to try to stop these things. What we have to see is that once you make a a bad policy decision and, and starts to be implemented, it, it has an effect. I mean, what about the the families that are separated at the border right now that still haven't been reunited, even though the U.S. is Supposedly trying to reunite them, um, there are still reports. The courts say they have children, to. Right, the courts say they have to. Uh, you know, the, the public opinion says that they have to do that, um, and, and yet, uh, you know, we we all know that there's many parents and children who still haven't been reunited. Well, that that affects the family. 
It I does. Can, can you imagine so. little children who grow up like that? Now, what does that do to them in the long run? How will they? Are we raising a generation of terrorists? No. That, well, they uh, well, I don't think they'll. Well, see, I, so I don't, I don't think it's necessarily that they would become. Uh, they would become uh, terrorists, or, or they, they could create an embitterness, but, but uh, who knows what they would become from. And I, I just wouldn't want to suggest that everybody who is bitter towards the U.S. would become a terrorist. Well, no, because the, future, the last few terrorists that we've seen were born and raised right here mm -hmm. in the United States. Correct. They didn't come from some strange place. Correct. So, so in fact, most of the, the violence that's taken place in the last two years has been from domestic uh, terrorists that didn't even come from the banned countries no. that, that we're talking about. Um, in fact, they didn't. They didn't come from the banned countries. They came from other countries, or they came. They were well, born here, right in, in the, the U.S. United States. Yes, these last those last three incidents we were talking about were all, all came from people who were yeah. all came from people who were homegrown. Yeah. So, and this uh, the. I hate to say the web, the social media, because I hate to brand all of it with a big brush, but the sites that these people gain uh, energy, let me put it that way, they gain energy and embolden them, like the site is called the Red Seed, S-E-E-D, and that does exactly that. It seeds these people in their hate, and not only against Jews, but everybody. Right. Everybody. So I, I hate to say that this is what's going on with the Internet, but that's what it is. Well, that, that's all the more reason why it's important to have shows like these, uh, where you can be able to inform people, educate them so that they can be able to uh, here, another side, of, <laughs> another side that that's uh, that's really been a, a long part of our history of how we have values that that uh, respect people, that believe in freedom, equality for people. That's what America is all about, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, yeah. and we want to keep it that way. And I I really thank you for always taking a step, the stand, uh, my being out there. Now you're going to encourage your new attorney general to. Take a stand. Oh, absolutely, and he's great, and I will. Uh, yeah, I, to I like him. him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, as always, for being our guest. Thank you for being who you are, taking a stand, and we will see you next time. Okay. Aloha, Marsha. Aloha, Aloha to the people.